Good afternoon. This is Darlene with Generations Health. Thank you so much for joining us for our webinar, Alzheimer's Disease Stages and Strategies for Care, presented by Jennifer Fitzpatrick. Before we get started, there are just a few things I'd like to cover. The first is we are so grateful to have Ingleside sponsoring today's webinar. And in just a few minutes, I'm going to ask Donna Fuller, who is here with Ingleside, uh, to share a little bit about them. Uh, but first, I do have a couple things that I need to cover with you. The first is everyone is going to be muted, and that is simply to eliminate any background noise. However, this is interactive, so we do encourage you to ask questions, to answer questions, to post comments that you have about the discussion that's taking place, and you can do that by utilizing the chat feature. As a refresher, if you scroll across the bottom of your screen, or it could be the very top of your screen, you're going to see a little banner that pops up, and on that, you're going to see a little bubble that says chat. When you click that, it, the chat feature is going to launch, and it will probably pull up on the right Right hand side of your screen. Now when you use chat to communicate with us, your questions, comments, answers, those are only going to come to uh, Jennifer, Donna, and myself. And the reason for that is simply privacy reasons. The other is Zoom has been experiencing outages globally this morning, and so we are hoping that we do not have any issues as we move forward with today's program. But because we are having um, some challenges, our uh, Jennifer and Donna will not be showing their photos or their pictures of them, so you're just going to see the PowerPoint today. However, it's still going to be just as fabulous. Unfortunately, you just won't be able to see their smiling faces. Um, okay, again, so any questions that you have, please feel free to utilize that chat feature. Um, and what I'd like to do is invite Donna Fuller to join us. And again, we're so grateful to have Ingleside sponsoring today. Donna? Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. This is Donna Fuller, Director of Outreach for Ingleside. And I am so sorry that I can't be present in face so you can see me, but I'm certainly thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm so pleased to be working with Generations, as always, to bring you these wonderful programs. Um, to tell you a little bit about Ingleside, I support both Ingleside at Rock Creek in Northwest DC, as well as Ingleside at King Farm in Rockville. And in the last year, we added small households that created optimal spaces for those living with Alzheimer's and other dementias. Um, and so now that we offer this fabulous program and our wonderful well-being philosophy that supports those that are living with us, we recognize the importance of understanding dementia and how important it is for caregivers and professionals to understand it on a deeper level, which is why we're offering this program today. So I hope that you really benefit from all the wonderful information that Jennifer's going to be sharing today. And I will be talking to you at the end of the program, but enjoy every minute and welcome again. Thank you so much for having me. Great. Thank you so much, Donna. Okay. Are you caring for someone who has dementia? Do you want to better understand the different stages? Would life be easier if you could communicate better with your loved one who has dementia? If you answered yes to any of these questions, this program was created for you. Our presenter today is the author of Cruising Through Caregiving, Reducing the Stress of Caring for Your Loved One, and a longtime gerontology instructor at Johns Hopkins University's Certificate on Aging program. She is one of less than 800 certified speaking professionals worldwide and has been featured in national media such as The Wall Street Journal, Reader's Digest, U.S. News and World Report, CBS, ABC, and many more. When she's not working, she... I'm sorry. When she's not working, today's presenter is fantasizing about when she can wander the aisles of TJ Maxx and Marshalls without a face mask. Please join me in welcoming from Kent Island, Maryland, Jennifer L. Fitzpatrick, MSW, LCSWC. 
Hi, everybody. Welcome. We're so happy to have you here today. Uh, as Darlene said, I uh, would love for you to write in your comments and questions in the chat section. We want you to get everything that you need from today's event. So feel free to write in at any point, any question that you may have. We're going to try to make this as interactive as possible. Uh, hopefully someday soon we will see each other in person. But in the meantime, uh, we uh, are really committed to making this as much as possible like an interactive in-person event. Uh, usually we do have our cameras on, so you can, Donna, you would have been able to see Donna and I. Uh, because of all the challenges Zoom is having, we thought it might be better just to try it without, not put as, try to put a, at least a little bit of pressure on Zoom as we can. Uh, so it, Alzheimer's disease and its stages and strategies for care. This program is really going to be all about what are the stages, where is your loved one and what do you want to do? What is going to be best practice for you and your family if your loved one is in a certain stage, whether it be early, middle, or late? So we're going to just talk for just a couple minutes about what we, what's not something to be concerned about. Now, I know there's probably many of you on this program who you already have, your loved one has already been diagnosed, or you, the doctor has said, yes, your loved one has a, a dementia. But just real briefly, I like to just share what you don't have to be concerned about. What, as we get older, a lot of people can get concerned themselves with their memory, their brain. Uh, a lot of family members start to struggle with worrying about their loved ones. But I want to go through a few things that you don't have to be concerned about. As we get older, our brain shrinks, our reflex and reaction time diminishes. We go through what is called benign senescence, which is just a little bit of mild forgetfulness. And this is why lists become more helpful, even more and more helpful as we get older. I don't know how I would get through my day without a list. We also have more tip of the tongue moments more frequently. And a lot of us will experience that when we were just about to tell, uh, ask our, our friend uh, a certain question and then we forget where our train of thought for a moment. Or, oh, I wanted to tell you about this great movie that I just saw. And then you forget the name of the movie for a moment and then it comes to you a little bit later. Normal, all, all normal. Uh, our speed and accuracy of movement is declining a little bit. Um, it may take us a little bit more time to learn, um, but misplacing a phone or, a, or keys and you can retrace your steps, not something to worry about. Uh, forgetting something that you wanted to tell somebody, remembering it later, maybe forgetting where you parked your car when you go to the grocery store, not understanding new complex information the first time you hear it. But here are some things that we should be concerned about. So those are ones that if you're thinking that you're concerned about your loved one, I just want to clarify that those are areas where you probably don't need to be too worried. You always want to talk to your doctor if you have concerns, but those are areas where you don't want to worry. These are areas where red flags are, where you may want to be thinking, hey, this is something that's concerning. So right now we're, we're taping this program in August of 2020, and I'm sure everybody on this program is more than aware that we are experiencing a pandemic and that there, a lot of the country and a lot of other countries have been shut down to a certain extent. And there's an election coming up and a lot of kids are working, doing school from home. A lot of people are working from home. If you truly don't realize that that's what's happening right now in the world, that would be something very concerning for you, that you remember it right now for a moment and then a little bit later today you say oh you know what I want to go to the movies and mom the movies are closed remember everything so much is shut down so that that's an example of something that should be that's definitely a concern your loved one's personality changes. Maybe they always had a great sense of humor. Now they don't. Maybe they were very gentlemanly and now they're using really bad language in front of the grandkids. Um, you know, forgetting who the president is, thinking the president is Reagan or Obama, genuinely forgetting who the president is or maybe what season it is. Those are some examples to be concerned about that might signal a dementia issue. Poor judgment. You know, we're in a really hot day, at least on the East Coast today, and maybe you're wearing a, a really heavy coat. You're, you're wearing a sweatshirt. This going outside in a really hot day, uh, wearing winter clothes, that could be a red flag. So 
all of those, if you're seeing those with your loved one and you haven't yet gotten a diagnosis for your loved one's condition, it's really important to know that there are times when someone can exhibit some of those types of symptoms and it could be something reversible. But what we're here to talk about today, oh my goodness, excuse me for one moment, where it says irreversible and permanent pseudodementia, actually pseudodementia should be where it says reversible and temporary. And Darlene, if you wouldn't mind sending me an email so I can fix that on this slide, uh, my apologies, but reversible and temporary could be pseudodementia. And so what might be some of the reasons that someone could potentially have pseudodementia? Uh, it could be delirium as, a, as it relates to uh, a urinary tract infection. There could be a B12 deficiency, depression, a lot of times when an older person experiences depression, it's not necessarily sadness. Uh, it, oftentimes, unfortunately, it, it comes with memory loss and confusion. So we always want somebody to get checked out by a doc uh, before we jump to any conclusions because, again, it, reversible and temporary and pseudodementia should be up there. And, of course, today what we're here to talk about is the stages of those that are irreversible and permanent. Okay, so mild cognitive impairment is a term that you may have heard before. So mild cognitive impairment is a decline in uh, executive functioning, language, memory. Um, so this 80% of people who have mild cognitive impairment or MCI will eventually develop Alzheimer's disease. Um, and again, we, we, in talking about mild cognitive impairment, we're seeing a decline in executive function like planning, decision making, uh, inhibition. We often see a lack of inhibition with somebody who maybe is, is experiencing mild cognitive impairment. Um, maybe they uh, are, are very, they were always very uh, quiet. And now they're very, very outgoing or they, they're very provocative or, or very flirtatious with others, um, maybe less modest with the clothing that they're wearing, for example. Um, so, again, these are some of the areas of executive function that can be impacted. So now we're going to talk about so, – so normal aging is – Right, that, that all those normal areas that we talked about, mild cognitive impairment can be a precursor. It's not quite a form of dementia, but it can be a, a precursor for a lot of people. But a lot of people just get diagnosed straight off with a type of dementia. And of course, the most common form is Alzheimer's disease, and nearly 6 million Americans suffer with Alzheimer's disease. It's the sixth leading cause of death in the U.S. And um, I, we're, we're going to talk about the other dementias for sure. So there's other dementias. Lewy body dementia is one. Frontotemporal dementia is another. Vascular dementia. Uh, there's, there's many, many different types of dementia, but Alzheimer's is the one that mm, we will encounter more often than the other dementia. It accounts for, for most, and it is the sixth leading cause of death. I liken, in my book, Cruising Through Caregiving, I liken the stages of Alzheimer's to getting around a foreign country. So I talk about the stages, and, and you may have seen scales where you've seen seven stages or 11 stages. I like to talk about the stages as early, middle, and late. I think it keeps it really simple. And this is a guide to sort of where is your loved one and, and this if you don't know where your loved one is at the moment in terms of stage i think the conversation we're about to have is going to help you so what i'd like you to be doing is thinking about the person that you care about whether it's your spouse whether it's your mom whether it's your grandmother your aunt uh, i want you to be thinking about that person and try to determine where do you think they are so i like in the stages to being a U.S. citizen who is, is visiting overseas, which very sadly we are unable to do right now, I uh, hope that that changes soon. Uh, but right now, so we have three flags up here, and one is the Irish flag, and the second one is the Italian flag, and the third flag is a flag that nobody has ever gotten correct when I've polled, and I said, oh, what, what, where, do you, uh, where, do you, what, where do you think that's from? And that flag, the last flag, is from Yemen. So I liken the early stages of Alzheimer's to be 
like visiting Ireland without making plans ahead of time. So if I were to say to you, let's pretend everything's normal, that today, uh, this afternoon, I'm going to have somebody pick you up in a limousine and they're going to drive you to your airport and you're going to go to Ireland. I've got everything packed for you. I've got your passports. Everything's ready. Your favorite person is going to accompany you. If you didn't do any pre-planning, if you didn't look up any travel sites, you're going to be fine because most of the time when you go to Ireland, a lot is similar to what's going on in the United States. The, you know, they, they speak a little bit differently. They have, you know, sort of a brogue. They, uh, they're, but, but you're going to be okay. The food's going to look similar. Uh, they speak English. And so the reason that I like in the early stages of dementia to Ireland is because a lot of times when you're with a loved one who is in the early stages of Alzheimer's, they're a lot like you and I, okay? So just like if you were to visit Ireland with no pre-planning, You know the language already. So there's going to be a lot of moments. You're going to be able to communicate and be with your loved one. And you're going to do just fine. But there's going to be moments where there's going to maybe be a word or a sign that you're not really sure what that means or part of a conversation that's challenging. So a lot of the time they're going to be a lot like you. And then there's going to be times where it's a little foreign. So what do we see in the early stages of Alzheimer's? We often see a lot of challenges with word finding and much more dramatic than the tip of the tongue uh, issues. We forgetting names of people you're close to. So maybe forgetting the name of your dog, maybe forgetting the name of your sister or mistaking your sister for your daughter or vice versa. Oftentimes the person who is in the early stages of Alzheimer's is very aware that something is wrong. Uh, In terms of losing an item, really unable to retrace your steps. So we've all, well, probably all of us at one point or another, we've lost something, whether it be our keys or our cell phone or a wallet. And we will take the measures to say, where was I? Where did I go? What was going on? Who was I with? And we, we take steps to retrace. And this is something that somebody in the early stages of dementia often can't do. But again, a lot of the times the person is very much like you and I. The person is able to to hold a conversation that they they remember um, what's going on. So how do we how do we adapt and how do we treat this person? So the first thing is we want to encourage diagnosis. So if a lot of people are never diagnosed in the early stages, which is a big mistake because in the early stages, a lot of doctors feel, you know, and and now more than ever, I think we all know not all doctors agree on everything, Uh, especially you see all different kinds of opinions happening right now about the pandemic. Uh, But doctors, um, some doctors feel like starting medicine in the early stages of Alzheimer's or another type of dementia makes a lot of sense. And depending on what they know about the person and and that person's issues. So we want to encourage this person to get a diagnosis. And it's kind of tough sometimes because if the person's reluctant, they still really do have capacity and they are able to make their own choices and make their own decisions. And, but, but at this point, they still probably are pretty decisional in a lot of ways. But we want to encourage them to get a diagnosis, to go see a doctor. And I think one of the reasons, one of the really important reasons is we don't want to, we want, don't want to miss if it is something like it could be, say it's, it's delirium, like it's a urinary tract infection and it can be treated with an antibiotic. We want them to do that. And then we don't have to worry about this anymore. But for some people, it might be that it truly is uh, the early stages of Alzheimer's. We want to acknowledge repeatedly one strategy in loving somebody who has early stages of Alzheimer's is you remind yourself daily, this person is still an adult. Your impulse to take over for everything is probably going to be there, but you've got to, oh, I I say that in cruising through caregiving over and over again. I have a whole chapter. Your older loved one is an adult. They're a grown up, and we want to acknowledge that. That's a really important part of working with somebody or loving someone in the early stages. 
we want to encourage the person to be really super proactive about his or her wishes. Do they want to update their will while they still are legally able to? Do they want to update any advanced directives? Do they want to change who their power of attorneys are? We want them to talk to us about their wishes. What do they want? What do they not want? We want them to put things in writing. And probably everybody knows most people, not a lot of people never do this. And they say, oh, well, my kids will just decide. They'll, they'll figure it out. And that creates a myriad of issues. Even if you've got, say you've got three adult kids and maybe they all love dad. They love dad. They all think dad's wonderful and they care for him. And they all might have the perfect, most wonderful, loving intentions. But one person thinks the person that dad should go to assisted living. The other person thinks dad will be completely fine living alone. The other person thinks that dad should be in home care. And right now, dad in you know a couple of years from now can't make the decision we really want to have these conversations and and put put stuff in writing so the person does have uh the ability to to make their own choices so in the early stages now you probably if you've ever been to any kind of session on alzheimer's or dementia or communication you've probably heard people say don't reality orient but I will say that in the early stages, again, in a lot of cases, remember, you're visiting Ireland. In the early stages of Alzheimer's, your loved one, a lot of times they're looking for clarification. They might say, it's August, right? And I think it's a good idea to, to clarify for them. Uh, or, or if they are in the early stages, a lot of times we say, oh, remember, we, we, we're not going to go to the grocery store. We're going to have groceries delivered because of the pandemic. Now, I don't think you should be constantly saying pandemic, pandemic, pandemic. It's, it's a very inflammatory word. It, can, it scares the heck out of all of us. Uh, but in particular, it can be very scary to hear that over and over again when your mind's not working properly. But what I, what I do think is, when you can give somebody a little bit of a uh, help. And so they might say, oh, that's right. That's right. We're doing grocery delivery now. We're not going to drive to the grocery store. So I think it, it, you, with reality orientation, I don't think you ever want to keep repeating and keep reality orienting. This is August. It's, today's the date. I remember when I first started working in nursing homes, I was 16 years old and we actually did that. Uh, 30 something years ago. Uh, yeah, we would say, okay, this is the day. And, and we would try to drill this reality orientation into people. It's not effective in the later stages, but in the early stages, when someone is asking questions or when they are still a lot of times in much like you, I think it's okay to share with them what's going on to a certain extent. That said, if they push back and say, no, it's not summer, it's spring, I recommend letting it go. Um, you can try to, I think in the early stages, you can try to reality orient a little bit or maybe one time, oh, it's your birthday, mom. And if she says, no, it's not, my birthday isn't till next month, I think you let it go. Okay, so when we get to the mid stages, and feel free, please feel free to write in any comments, any questions at all that you wanna have answered. We would love to, answer, whether they be for Donna, uh, at Ingleside or whether they be for me, we, we love to have your feedback or any kind of questions in particular that might have to do with your loved one or your family situation. I liken the mid stages of Alzheimer's to visiting Italy with no preparation. So let's say you, same thing, I have a limousine pick you up and you and your favorite person are going to Italy tonight with no pre-planning, you haven't checked out those Rick Steves books, you haven't downloaded a English to an Italian app, you haven't done any research whatsoever, but you're gonna get dropped off and you're gonna go to the beautiful countryside, the Tuscany area of Italy. Now, while people in Italy often do speak English in some of the cities, in the countryside, a lot of people do not, or they speak very limited English. And let's say you don't speak Italian and you've done no prep. I believe that taking care of a loved one in the mid stages of Alzheimer's is much like visiting Italy and without prep, without knowing the language. So a lot is going to be familiar. You're gonna have a lot of moments with that person that is, is like they always have been. There's gonna be some moments where they are like themselves the way that they've always been, but you're gonna get a lot of moments where they're not. 
And let's talk about Italy for a minute. You go to Italy with no prep. You've never gone. You don't speak the language. You know, but some of the things that are going to be familiar, food's going to look familiar. The wine's going to probably look familiar. Uh, sometimes the architecture might look familiar. Um, body language translates over in Italy. So if you gesture that you want your check or your bill after you dine at a restaurant, they're going to probably know what it means when you do the little, uh, you know, writing in the air, like you're writing with a pen in the air. I, this is where I wish I had my camera on so I could do the gesture for you. But, or, or when maybe you pick up your hand and you act as though you're drinking, maybe a server will know that you would like a beverage, you'd like to order a beverage. So we, there's going to be similarities, but that said, um, and also let's, let's think if you, if you took a romance language when you were in school, you know, if maybe you took Spanish, maybe you took French, you're probably going to be able to pick up some of the words, but that said, there's going to be a lot that's unfamiliar. Uh, the, the way that the, the, the cars are very different over there, uh, the way they drive, the signs are going to look unfamiliar. Um, and again, if you don't speak the language, it's going to be, it's going to be challenging, especially if you're in the countryside like Tuscany. So I liken the mid stages is much like visiting a foreign country like Italy without a whole lot of prep. So what's involved in the mid stages, we're going to see wandering. People don't wander until they wander. I have worked with countless family caregivers who say, well, my mom doesn't wander. That's great until the day that she does, because about 60% of people with different types of dementia do wander at some point. And it can be very, very dangerous. Every single day when you see a silver alert or a golden alert, it's different in different states. Uh, it probably means that somebody drove away in a car and they are or they've walked away from their home and they have dementia. We see more with hallucinations and delusions, and they often are very paranoid. They believe that you're stealing from them, that you're cheating on them, you're hiding something from them. So there's a lot of, of fear and anxiety with these hallucinations and delusions. They think they're seeing somebody. Maybe they think they saw a burglar underneath their bed and they don't want to go to sleep in their room. So the, the longer, the, as, and when the disease progresses, they're going to have a harder time understanding you. You're going to have a harder time understanding them. So while there's going to be moments where the person is, um, there's going to be um, moments where that person um, does have, um, th there's going to be moments where that person does have, uh, is going to be just like they've always been. There's also going to be a lot of moments that are, are very, very challenging. going to give me one moment. I'm getting a signal that uh, my Zoom connection is a little spotty, so I'm just uh, checking in with my fellow panelists. Yes, you, uh, your screen went away, but we can still hear you. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm about to share my screen again. I did that intentionally because it was saying my, uh, my Zoom connection was, was spotty, um, so I'm going to put my slides back up again. All right. So what does the mid stages of Alzheimer's look like? So we talked about um, not just the wandering or them having a harder time understanding us, but we also see more challenges with activities of daily living. So your loved one might forget how to dial a phone, but that's today. Maybe tomorrow they, they know how to dial a phone. Or maybe, so that's really an instrumental, an IADL, instrumental activity of daily living. Or perhaps your loved one is uh, not able to brush their teeth today. They forget that they have to put toothpaste on their toothbrush, but tomorrow they're brushing their teeth fine. So it can be really, really stressful. All of Alzheimer's disease is stressful, but this is so tough because it's like you don't always know what to expect. And again, that's why I liken it to Italy because when you're in the countryside of Italy, there might be moments where you encounter somebody who speaks perfect English and, and, you know, it's great at, you know, you're on the same page and then you go to another area of the Tuscany area and you're encountering people who speak no English. So just, 
you got to be prepared for knowing that knowing is trying to know as much as you can and, and realizing that every day can be different week to week can be different. And there can sometimes be some false hope because we think, well, mom was herself today. She remembered all the grandkids. She, she remembered how to use a fork. And then there's a day where she doesn't. And it can be very, very frustrating because we sometimes will expect, well, she, she remembered everybody's name today. Why not tomorrow? So I liken the late stages of Alzheimer's to the visiting Yemen. So let's play this out again. I have you get picked up in a limousine. Your favorite person's waiting for you. We take you to the airport. If you go to Yemen with no preparation, you are going to be lost because they speak and write Arabic which looks nothing like English. So if you didn't study, you didn't learn Arabic, you didn't read up on customs, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. There, they have special ways that people dress. There are customs. There are certain things you might do with body language or facial expressions that could be very offensive that could perhaps land you in, in legal trouble even. So you want to really understand the customs if you're going to a place like this. It's very, very different from the United States. So if you go to Yemen with no prep, it is, I think it's very much like the late stages of Alzheimer's. In the late stages, people can't do, very rarely can they do their activities of daily living. So brushing their hair, taking a shower or a bath, dialing a phone number, it's very hard for this person, you know, never mind cooking, that it's going to be tough. Um, there's going to be increased dependence. So what really sneaks up on a lot of family caregivers is that it's physically taxing. And this is where people start to really, if they haven't already hit a wall, they start saying, all right, I need to bring my loved one to a senior living community like in Ingleside, or I need to make sure that I have help in the home all the time, whether it's friends, whether it's family, whether they hire somebody because it is so exhausting and taxing. Um, Their vocabulary is pretty much gone, maybe a word, a couple of words, maybe they're communicating with sound, but body language is huge. Facial expressions, reading their facial expressions. And this is why it can be very challenging with a lot of folks um, wearing masks. You know, we, I don't know that we, I think all of us, sometimes forget when this mask thing started, we all started to remember, gosh, we really do read each other's lips. We really do read each other's facial expressions. So you want to be really, really mindful of that. So if you have, especially somebody in the late stages and you're wearing some sort of face covering, that that can be really hard for them to see how you're trying to communicate with them because they are really oftentimes they're, they're trying to see, are you smiling? Are you frowning? They are constantly reading your body language because that's how they're able to communicate. So we, when we work with professionals, we always are talking to, to uh, health and mental health professionals. When you're working with someone with dementia, we always want to be really mindful of our body language. But when somebody has, you know, with any client, with any patient that you might work with, but especially somebody with dementia, because they're not really able to understand a lot of what we are verbally saying anymore. Um, so I've got a question. Um, my partner and I both retired and are trying to decide on the next step. It includes being able to put my brother in a nearby assisted living memory care. He's currently living with my sister under one scenario. We'd have to move him twice with about a year in between moves. Does that sound way too hard on him? Based on your slides, I would say he's in the early part of middle stages. Okay. That's a great question. Thank you for, for, um, for sharing that. So obviously it's, I think what we've got to be mindful of is every single individual person with dementia is an individual and you can't make blanket statements. You always want to do this. You never want to do this. I do believe that moving more than once, you want to try to avoid it if you can, because it's an enormous adjustment. Now, sometimes that can't be helped. There's a variety of reasons why sometimes that has to happen that way, that that they have to move twice. But I I don't want to, I'm going to actually share it. You know, if you've moved 
recently, I'm actually in the pro in the uh, process of moving and I don't have dementia. My husband doesn't have dementia. Thank God our brains are working well, but it's a lot of stress. It's exhausting. And think about, I think about when someone does actually have dementia, it's a lot of stress getting used to new people, getting used to a new household, getting used to where the bathroom is. So I, I think it really, it, you know, you, you have to do what's right for you and your family. You have to consider the financial component of it as well. But I, I would recommend to try to limit the moves if you can. But if you can't, and sometimes you can't, if you can't, I would just remind yourself that you are going to go through sort of a, a little bit of trauma with your loved one. It, it sounds like it's your brother um, twice. So you got to be patient when you move him the first time. There is going to be some growing pains. It's going to be a big adjustment. You have to be patient. Let the staff um work their magic. If, if you pick a good community, they like in Ingleside, they're going to, you know, they're going to do, they, they know a lot about dementia and they're going to be able to help uh, transition there. You, know, you want to listen to them, pick a place that you trust and listen to what the staff are saying on how to make the adjustment go smoothly. But remember, you're going to have to do it twice. And just when you move both times, when you move your brother both times, what I would recommend is don't have a lot of other stressful events on the calendar. Like I wouldn't start a new job the week you're moving your brother for the second time, or I would, you know what I'm saying? Like I, I wouldn't, um, you know, have your grandkids move into your house with you the week you're moving your brothers. I'd try to keep your stress to a minimum, plan a lot of good self care, whatever kinds of activities calm you, whether it's meditating or prayer or exercise or whatever you do to relax and keep yourself uh, in good shape and calm, but just know that it, make sure you get plenty of support from family and friends both times, maybe see a therapist, maybe join a support group and, and, you know, they, the people in support groups are amazing. The, the way that they have been through stuff. So if you can manage it, I'd try to do one move if possible. Sometimes that's not the case that you're not going to be able to do that, but um, just give yourself lots of space and give your brother lots of space to adjust and listen to the staff at the community where you bring them. Make sure it's a community that you're comfortable with. You like the staff, you trust them and listen to them and their expertise. So that's what I would say. If you've got any follow up questions and I am sorry, I cannot read your name. I'm afraid I'm going to mispronounce it, but to the person that asked that question, it's a great question. If you would uh, like any follow-up questions, feel free to write in. But for the rest of you all, feel free to write in any comments or questions. I'm glad to answer anybody. Okay. So the late stages of Alzheimer's are tough. I think a lot of times physicians are so focused on getting in, in the early stages or more often people get diagnosed in the mid stages they're focused on let's look at the meds and, and let's, you know, get you through today. Let's get you involved in a support group. I don't think most, I think a lot of good, well-intentioned docs and other health and mental health professionals, we're just trying to get folks through that, that week, that month, that year that no one's really saying, Hey, down the road, it's going to be exhausting. It's going to be physically taxing. It's going to be taking care of somebody truly everything, their physical body and mentally, and they're not going to be able to communicate with you. You're not going to be able to communicate with them the way that you normally would. So it's a lot to be concerned about. So you're seeing now uh, my, my little nephew Enzo on our boat. Uh, I want everybody to always be remembering that a person with dementia is an adult, but much of their language is going to be like a small child. So, when uh, Enzo saw something on the boat that he wanted to go look at, he points at it. Same thing when he was, I think he was about two and a half when this, this was taken. Uh, when we would go out to eat, before his verbal skills were really fully formed, he would point when he wanted to ketchup for his french fries. That is what you're going to see a lot going on with a loved one who has dementia. So it's very regressive. 
it, the person does seem like a child in a lot of their expression and a lot of their language. It's their way of communicating to you. So I remember, especially, you know, I've taken care of, been a caregiver several times in the course of my life, but my husband's grandma, when she was dying of cancer, she at one point, um, you know, until like the last day or two, she could tell us what she wanted. She could tell us what she needed. And it was, it, it was not hard to communicate with her. I mean, I'd say, would you, do you want me to leave you alone? Do you want to sleep? Do you want a cup of tea? Do you want a sandwich? Yes, no. She could tell you if she was hot. Can you, you know, bring in a fan? And so caregiving is always hard. But when the person you're caring for can say, hey, here's what I need. Here's what I want. Then it's a little bit, it's actually quite a bit easier. But when someone has dementia in the later stages, especially, or even sometimes in the mid stages, if they're hot, they're going to throw off the blanket and put it on the floor. If they're tired and you're at a party, you brought your loved one to a party, they might just go sit in the corner because they, 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 they don't know what else to do. They just, they're trying to express that they are tired and they don't want to be part of the conversation. So you always want to be remembering that somebody with dementia is they're going to become very, very uh, self-centered. And when I say self-centered, I don't mean selfish. I mean that their communication is going to be all about just getting their needs met. And, and it's because they're not going to be as independent as they once were. So for all of us who we might be at a party and we don't want to be there anymore, we're going to make up an excuse or we're going to say, oh, you know, it's good to see everybody. I'm going to go. And somebody with dementia they either don't have the language or maybe they didn't drive themselves there, or maybe they just walk out the front door and they don't tell anybody because they forget that they came with other people. So eat, but we want to remember that even though their language, their communication skills are very much going to become more childlike, they are still a grown up and they deserve to be treated with the dignity of an adult. So feel free to write in any more comments or questions. I'm really happy to answer them. So what do we want to do? We want to validate their feelings. And there's a great book called The Validation Breakthrough by Naomi File that talks about validating and being in the moment with your loved one. If she's talking about uh, Christmas, even if it's August, maybe talk about Christmas. And she wants to plan what you're going to eat for Thanksgiving. And you know that Thanksgiving's not for a while. Talk about a Thanksgiving menu. Be in the moment. She's talking about someone that's long gone, has passed away. Maybe we reminisce. We look at photographs of that person. Redirect. So somebody starts to walk out the front door and you're thinking to yourself, well, it's not time for a walk. I've got, I'm working from home myself. I can't take mom for a walk. I redirect her. Maybe I put on some music that she likes. Maybe I get her engaged in painting, you know, and again, in the, the great thing about it, 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 somebody with dementia, even though their language and a lot of their ability to take care of themselves is diminishing, they still can do some activities. They often, it, now late stages, usually not as much at the very end, but in terms of exercise or walking or doing art projects or helping cook in the kitchen with supervision, they can still participate in activities like that. In the late stages, I believe one of the best things we can do is, is have on music that that person likes. I think it's one of the most powerful tools that you can, you can utilize in, in a strategy and working with someone in the late stages. Engage in preventive activity. And so, I think, you know, Nancy Reagan, former um, First Lady Nancy Reagan, she, of course, took care of President Reagan when he had Alzheimer's, and she was really vocal that he would never move to senior living or he would never, you know, leave their home. And she had a lot of resources, though, that most of us don't have, including the Secret Service. And I'm guessing that if President Reagan ever wandered, that's who prevented him from leaving their home. But what do we want to do preventively so they are not walking out the front door? Try to get them exercise, like build exercise into the day. Um, if you're not quite ready for senior living, maybe 
utilize adult day so the person your loved one is tired out that they're engaged in activities they're exercising they're socializing with other people during the course of the day and they're tired at night so a lot of family caregivers will say oh my gosh my my husband's up all night it's awful well what was he doing all day and if you say well he watches tv he's dozing in his favorite chair He's reading the newspaper upside down. And a lot of people just that, that having that newsprint in their hand feels good to them, but they're actually maybe not even reading. That's not preventive. That's going to be contributing to him not sleeping at night because he's not, he's not wearing himself out. He's not exercising. He's not stimulated. So we want to try to engage in preventive activity by getting that person stimulated during the day. What do we not want to do? We don't want to correct past early stages. And even in the early stages, we don't want to correct, uh, you know, if mom thinks it's, it's a tonica and, you know, it's August, we, I think we, if she's in the early stages, we might say, oh yeah, mom, we got a little time till Hanukkah gets here. She might say, oh, that's right, it's still summer. But then, again, she might not. She might say, I want to start planning what I'm going to buy the kids. And I think you want to just flow with that. It's validating. Validate her. She, she wants to just talk about what we're going to get the kids for Christmas. Go with it. Don't correct her. Never argue with your loved one. You will never get anywhere, but we see families do this all the time. Power struggles. Um, my, I, I didn't eat lunch. Mom, yes, you did. You just had lunch. We just had, we just had uh, shrimp salad sandwiches. They were so good, weren't they? I didn't eat lunch. Where is that getting you? Maybe, Mom, what would you like? Uh, Mom, you know what? I'm going to bring out some crackers, and we'll have that until, you know, till lunch, because you know dinner is going to come up in a couple hours, and maybe bring out a little snack. Don't argue with her. She, the more that we argue, it leads to not just verbal aggression, physical aggression. Because remember that the person who has dementia, uh, their communication skills are very limited. Their reasoning skills are very, very limited. And so for if you keep saying you had lunch, you had lunch. Remember we had the shrimp salad. It wasn't it delicious. She might start to yell at you she might start, she might actually push you. There are a lot of people who have never been violent a day in their life who actually become physically aggressive. And sometimes it's because of a hallucination or a delusion. Maybe they think that they see a burglar and they're swatting at the air. But sometimes it's because our, somebody that they love or even sometimes sadly a healthcare professional, it becomes argumentative with them. And so it's our job. Nobody, and of course, you don't ever deserve to get hit. We, we're not saying that. But we are saying that there are things that you can do to prevent. You know, it's a, this is very different than, um, you know, this is not a domestic violence conversation. That's a different, different class and different seminar entirely. But if your loved one has never been violent and suddenly you or somebody else in your family or a healthcare professional has argued with them repeatedly and telling them they're wrong, telling them that they, that they're not correct, that there is a possibility that person's going to become very verbally aggressive and sometimes even physically aggressive. And we've got to just do our part to try to de-escalate. Don't argue. Don't expect what's working today to work forever. So in cruising through caregiving, I always use the analogy of boating. You know, if you're going to boat in, you know, the east direction and it's really windy, maybe a course correct, you go west. Well, in caregiving, we need to do the same thing. If things are going well today for you, you've got your husband at home, you both are doing well, everything's fine, he's in the early stages, that's terrific. Maybe you don't need to do anything right now. But it might be helpful just to have information about, communities like Ingleside, maybe home care, maybe adult day, maybe it might be a good idea to have information about support groups in case you need them at some point. So you want to always be considering what you, what resources might you need someday. And just know that whatever's working today may not work in a month, in a year, in five years. And I think a lot of families make this big promise 
that they're going to never move their loved one, like Nancy Reagan. And they realize that it is a very, very hard promise to keep. And I want to encourage everybody not to make any promises, except you do the best you can to take care of your loved one with the resources that you have. So um, when you're in the mid stage or the late stages, you've got to know that you've got to go where your loved one is. You cannot expect them. Their brain is broken. Their brain is not working properly. Guess whose brain is working properly? Ours. We are the fortunate ones. So we just do not want to get into a power struggle with our loved one. Um, Pamela is saying Ingleside at King Farm. Hey, Pamela uh, has a care partner support group that meets on the first and third evenings of each month. Uh, Now through Zoom, it's the first and third Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. So that's great information. Awesome. So I'm guessing that we would go to Donna to, and we're going to pull up Donna's information again in a few moments um, to sign up for that. That's wonderful. Thanks so much for that, Pamela. You can resist power struggles. And one of the ways that you resist the power struggle, I think one of the reasons that people get in power struggles with their loved ones who have dementia, one of the main main reasons is because they are burnt out. So you've got to get help. If you're at home with your loved one, don't be the only one providing care. You've got to have friends and family involved or maybe a hired person, or maybe it's time to consider, consider senior living. There was a family I worked with once where the husband constantly was talking about a 4th of July picnic that they had annually. And he he started talking about this in the middle of winter, constantly, every night. We have to start planning for the 4th of July picnic. Got to plan for the 4th of July picnic barbecue. What are we going to get? Who are we going to invite? And the wife got so angry. She wound up in a power struggle with him. And, you know, we, we don't have a 4th of July barbecue. And besides, it's winter. <laughs> and uh, eventually it comes out that the barbecue that he was talking about is in his long-term memory. It was an event that he used to plan with his, his first wife. And the wife, the second wife that's now caring for him is really, really upset. And she, you know, she's feeling unappreciated. She's feeling like she's not taking good care of him. And he's, he's gone ahead and, and thinking about his, his first wife, like what, but it's just, his brain isn't working properly, but she was getting into a power struggle with her husband and just saying, it's, it's January, it's winter. It's not time for a barbecue. And by the way, we've never had that event. It got her nothing but her blood pressure raised. And so what I had said to this woman was, you know, obviously, you know, and he became very verbally aggressive with her and she was even afraid of physical aggression because he was getting so angry because she kept refuting him. And what we determined was she just needed more help. She, she didn't have the energy um, to just listen to him talk about a 4th of July barbecue. I'm sure many of you who've been in this situation before, you've probably said to yourselves, Uh, Maybe you learned, maybe you said, you know what, let's just talk about it. Should we buy hot dogs? Should we buy veggie burgers? Should we buy potato salad? And some of you maybe are in the situation where you're saying, well, gosh, why, why should the wife have to do that? But the thing is, is that she's never going to convince him that it's not time for 4th of July. If in that moment in his brain, it's 4th of July, she's never going to convince him otherwise. We have to have the power to resist power struggles. And the way we do that is taking good care of ourselves, getting help, you know, utilizing services like senior living or adult day or home care and going to support groups, maybe even going to a psychotherapist for ourselves or, and or anything else that can be helpful for, for self care. Okay. Okay. Two dudes watching football. Uh, so I'm not saying all guys are like this, but I write about this in cruising through caregiving. My husband and his friend once went out to watch a game. They had some beers and I know that my husband's friend had recently broken up with his girlfriend. And when my husband got back, I said, Sean, how's Bill doing? And he's like, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know, the, the big breakup happened. How's he feeling? And he says, Oh, it didn't come up. And I said, it didn't come up. What do you mean? And he says, no, we, we didn't talk about it. So what did you talk about? He's like, oh, not really much. We just watched the game. And again, I know not every guy is like that, 
But I do believe that a lot of times when two dudes hang out, they do an activity together. They play golf. They listen to a concert. They uh, watch a football game. And I think a lot of times, more often, females, when they're together, they're talking, talking, talking. And I know that for me, if one of my friends had just broken up with someone, I we would have talked about it. I do believe that that would have come up. But what I want to recommend to all of you is if you have a loved one who has dementia, please know that you are able to just be with that person. Do her nails. You don't have to have a meaningful conversation. She might not be capable of that anymore. Watch a, you know, put on old ESPN right now or, or put on a baseball game if they like baseball or take a walk together or maybe if, if that person's still able to swim, go swimming together or do an art project together or listen to music, dance together, do an activity even if someone's at late stages, just sitting with them, rubbing their back or putting on music that they enjoy, try to be like two dudes watching a football game. And, and again, I, I, I realize not, not all guys are like that. Not all ladies are like what I'm describing, but if both, if you can just be with your loved one, don't expect long, meaningful conversations. And I know that that's a loss for a lot of you. Maybe you're, spouse was your most important confident. Maybe your mom always gave you great advice and that's not available anymore. It's hard, but go where he or she is. Try to just spend time together. Just be. So some resources that I want you all to make sure you know about is N4A to find your local area agency on aging, the Alzheimer's Association, the 24-hour helpline, which is totally free, is 800-272-3900. And just some information about some of the other dementias for Lewy body, for frontal temporal. And uh, Seth and Lauren Rogan's charity, um, HFC, which was formerly called Hilarity for Charity, I'm actually on their care advisory board. And uh, they have some wonderful resources, support groups, and care grants. And here are just some really terrific books that I think might be able to help you. So if you would like to grab a free chapter of Cruising Through Caregiving and all of the worksheets, please go to cruisingthroughcaregiving.com. Thank you all for spending some time with us. We're going to keep that chat section open. And I'm going to invite Donna Fuller back to talk to us for a few moments. And I'm going to pull up her slides in a just a moment. Okay, here we go. Oops. Thank you, Jen. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate it and hope that, and I'm sure you got a lot out of that presentation. Um, as Jen was talking about, there are so many wonderful resources out there for people who are um, going through this journey um, with a loved one who is living with Alzheimer's or a related dementia. If you know anybody who would benefit from a small residential setting like Ingleside, either at Rock Creek in Northwest DC or King Farm in Rockville, do not hesitate to reach out to us. If we can even just be a listening ear or a resource for you um, to provide you with guidance, we are always happy to be there for you, understanding how complex and emotional of a process this can be. W wanted to also say that um, our next upcoming program with Generations will be on September 29th from 12 to 1, learning your loved one's new language, mastering dementia fluency, so um, please feel free to join us. We'll be sending out more information about that shortly. And of course, if you have any questions at all, you see my contact information here. Do not hesitate to reach out to me either via phone or email and um, have a wonderful day. And please feel free to ask us questions as we're here for the next few minutes. Thank you so much. Jennifer, did you wanna say anything else? I'm gonna let Darlene wrap us up. Great. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful week, Darlene. Great, thank you so much. And thank you, Ingleside Donna, for hosting today's program. Uh, I did put a link into the chat. It is for a quick survey. Really, it's super quick. It'll take you just a minute or two to complete, and we would appreciate your feedback on today's program. Uh, 
Other than that, again, thank you so much, Donna and Ingleside, for hosting this. If you do have any questions, we will leave this open for just another minute or so as we're wrapping up. Um, but otherwise, I hope that you have a great day. Thanks for joining us, and we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Take care.